Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Lady Leadership Podcast. I'm really excited to have Felicity Fury on the show tonight. Now, Felicity is an award-winning engineer and founder of the Professional Leaders Institute, and she now mentors high-performing teams and equips emerging leaders with the skills they need to make an impact and drive meaningful change. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. Now, I want to, uh, as the daughter of an engineer and someone who's... uh, spent 30 years working in IT. Let's talk about your engineering background. Yeah, well, I'm trained as a civil engineer. So if you've driven on a road in Brisbane, Sydney or Melbourne, you've probably driven on a road that I helped build. And I love that engineers get to create the world around us. And it's something I never, ever would have expected that I would do and would be a career that I'd go into. What made you choose engineering then? Just run me through that. Well, I was in school, I loved art, I felt like I was really creative, I loved history, but I also loved physics and my year 12 physics teacher suggested that I did engineering and my first thought was engineers are really smart and I'm kind of an average student and I thought engineers sat down and did calculations all day and I was not, I'd say I wasn't a maths person, so I thought it wasn't a career for me, but because he said that maybe I thought I could do it, then maybe I thought I could. So uh, I put it as my fifth preference at university and then that's what I got into, not arts or science that I put as my first preferences, but straight into engineering. So I thought I'd give it a go. And once I saw the impact that engineers can make, I absolutely fell in love with it. Beautiful. I love it. And now you've moved more into the field of leadership. Tell me about that sort of transition. Yeah, so I started off, um, I guess, my business side of things while I was an engineer. I saw there weren't many women in engineering. And so when I was 25, I started a not-for-profit to get more girls and more diverse people into engineering. And through the success of that, we ran, we run hundreds of events across Australia, raised over a million dollars from corporates to fund the program. It also ignited a passion in me for business. And I saw that business could really create change. And then I became a leader, I guess, early on at that 25 year old mark, not really sure where I was going in my career or what I was doing, but through starting this organization, I thought, oh, okay, I have to kind of step into this leadership and I didn't expect that. So um, I felt that I um, had some skills that could be helpful as a leader, but really wasn't sure what I was doing. So I kind of fumbled my way into it. And along the way, I also noticed that there weren't many women or different people in the leadership roles in engineering as well. So started off in attracting more diverse talent into engineering and now I'm focused on retaining and accelerating those leadership journeys of women and diverse people in the STEM profession. Oh, so good. So good. Love it. Yeah. As a, a, yeah, I've been a, worked as a CIO for the last um, 10 years. And so, you know, I've always uh, been looking at the numbers and I think we've kind of taken similar paths in terms of, you know, establishing yourself in a career and then, um, you know, working out what your kind of true passion is and what you enjoy as well. Yeah. 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 It's hard to know what your passion is going to be. I think, especially something like engineering where you're not really exposed to it or business I wasn't really exposed to. So it's definitely been a bit of trial and error for me along the way. Mm. Yeah, I sort of discovered that, you know, I what I enjoyed the most out of my job was, so, you know, IT, same, same, but different type. Um, and sure, IT is, you know, like changed phenomenally in the last like 30 years and I'm showing my age here. Um, but what I've enjoyed is, you know, being able to hire, promote, support women and encourage more women to have careers in that technology space and, you know, across STEM as well. And what I've discovered is, you know, that the more, what I'm passionate about is having more women in leadership roles as well. And then, um, you know, having that sort of 40, 40, 20 and helping organisations, you know, hire, promote, support, you know, job parity, promotion parity, pay parity, that type of thing. That's what I'm really focused on. And as much as I can help women and coach women, we also kind of need to uh, help organisations and change the system so the two can meet absolutely yeah and then yeah encourage you know those really kind of diverse careers in terms of you know technology has allowed me to see the world and you know allowed me to work in lots of places etc but this is not a podcast about me this is a podcast about you (laughs) and so let's talk then now do, do you have a background in aviation as well I think I saw that on your um website 
Yeah, I'm really passionate about aviation. I'd say I'm an aspiring aviator. I haven't quite got my pilot license yet and COVID did kind of put a spanner in the works. And I think, um, you know, flying is such something I've always been passionate about. And uh, recently I got approached by a guy called Steve who owns happens to own two fighter jets. And he said, do you want to come flying with me? How could I say no to that? And he yeah. wants to inspire young people into STEM and engineering as well. So we took a trip up to regional Queensland where uh, my business partner is actually from, a place called Gainder. And we did an air show for her hometown for the primary school students and the high school students there. And it was amazing. So um, the plan is that we would make that into a documentary, but COVID happened and there's been a lot of change at the moment. So it's still on my to-do list and something I'm really passionate about. And I think another underrepresented area for women only six percent of pilots are women which just seems crazy beautiful love it yeah i'm actually in a few weeks um after easter interviewing lani Keneally, who's in the australian defense force who's a she's a pilot and she works with the un as well so i'm super excited about that podcast coming up and then my dad's actually an aircraft engineer so oh, cool. um yeah he's he's worked on helicopters and fixed wing and light wing his whole life so i spent a lot of time in and around aircraft as well so Great, but let's talk. Um, let's talk some leadership um, uh, qualities, and let's talk. Tell me about the Professional Leaders Institute. So we created the institute because we wanted to fast track leaders in their in their careers and get them to those leadership roles as you know as quickly as possible, so we can create this this diverse leadership. Um, yeah in corporate Australia. And so where we specialize in is we help um, aspiring, aspiring leaders or, or emerging leaders to uh, to get there faster. And I think a lot of leadership programs in, in particularly in corporate, you do it once you're a leader and it's sort of like, oh, you, you're in these roles, let's get you the training. That is so where, true, yeah. Yeah, yeah we want to take the approach where we are training leaders before they're in those, those positions so they're confident and ready to lead. I think the other thing about a lot of leadership programs is it's really theoretical and you don't get that practical training. And certainly uh, from the experiences I've had through starting this not-for-profit and other businesses, I felt like I had the space to fail because it was a safe environment. I wasn't at the risk of my job if I made a mistake. So we um, we train our leaders with different projects where they actually get to experience those skills for themselves. So they're not you know feeling like they're going to lose their job or get in trouble from their boss from it. So it's really, really practical and they're discovering the skills for themselves and their strengths as well along the way. And what do you see as the benefits then for organisations to have that, you know, diverse leadership, so to speak? Well, uh, with, when you there's some interesting research done by HBR actually on this, and they talk about uh, diverse teams. And when you're in diverse teams, it can feel really uncomfortable when you're trying to make a decision and it can take a little bit longer sometimes to get there. So we often... Um, find that leadership hires like you know people that are like yeah. them and yeah, obviously yeah. It's like the tribe and uh, it makes sense from a human psychological perspective to do that and it's kind of not your first choice to get someone who's a bit different um i know for me when i started my first business my business partner is very different from me i'm like the ideas and the vision person and she's the the detail person and we work really well together but often we have clashes and in the beginning i'd go i've got this great idea can i tell you about it and she'd go i'll have a think about it i'll get back to you in a few days and it used to drive me nuts because <laughs> i wanted to workshop and i wanted to brainstorm it but she talked a lot about how that, that difference is really helpful. So um, this HBR research showed that it's uncomfortable when we have people who are different. So um, we, we think that organisations can really benefit from this by um, helping those people who might be different with those different skills get into those leadership roles. And ultimately, those leaders are making decisions about the company and then that perpetuates that diversity down the chain. Yeah, that's right. Um, tell me then about like the key to empowering emerging leaders. What do you see as the key? So they're confident and ready to lead. I think what makes them confident and ready to lead is when they get that ownership of choice. And we've seen that recently with our program, uh, the Millennial Leadership Program. At first it was, here are the rules and here's what you need to do and here are the boxes that you have to tick. And we realised, oh my gosh, we're doing exactly what we don't want to have happen is this kind of box ticking approach and following the rules. So we turned the program on its head and we said, look, everything is optional. Um, you get to choose and you get to drive it. And it was incredible. Most of the leaders actually did everything that was still in the program. They had minor tweaks to make it personal to them, but it gave them the ownership and then it gave them the drive. So I think that's a real key in 
emerging leaders is giving them that leadership and that responsibility rather than that telling them what to do approach. They can really own it and drive it themselves. I think sometimes it's kind of good to state the the outcome that you might like and then the way that they get there is up to them. It's a bit like, you know, I'd like the house cleaned and mm-hmm. then, you know, however that perpetuates, you know, the house will be clean. Maybe it's not to your exact standards or maybe yeah. it's not exactly how you'd like it. It's not how you'd do it, but the house is clean. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah exactly. I love the and analogy. Maybe, maybe they're, you know, over, over um, what's the word? Over delivered in one area. So maybe something that you wouldn't have thought in has been, you know, it, um, exceeded your expectations, so to speak. Mm. Absolutely. And uh, I love the uh, similar analogy of a sailing ship. So you've got the way you start and where you finish, but along the way, there's going to be change in the winds and you're going to have to pull on different aspects of the boat. I'm not a sailor, so I'm going to probably butcher this analogy, uh, but then they they find their way there and it might have been a different path or they might have had to go out a little bit further than they had to. Um, or yeah, there might be um, better steering techniques from some of the other members on the ship, um, but eventually they get to that destination and they get to choose that path along the way. Yeah, it's one of the things that I sometimes see is quite difficult for people to step from saying being a sole contributor to being leading a team and having that realisation that you don't have to be in the detail of everything, that you actually need to let people lead themselves and you can talk through, you can be there to help and to guide and but kind of like giving someone the problem and letting them own it in its entirety and then saying being confident enough in your own capability as well that you don't have to be in the detail of everything and control everything it's a real I find it a real kind of mind shift you know shift mindset shift I was supposed to say yeah Absolutely. Yeah. It's that balance of that. It's like the independence, but freedom. And how do you give someone enough kind of guidance and boundaries and then that freedom as well to, to really go for it and express themselves and try different things. And I think it's exciting with young, young leaders or emerging leaders or people who haven't worked in the same industry as you, because they have these creative ideas that you haven't thought of because you're in that, that mindset um, mm. like of the way that you've always been doing it. So I think it's really exciting to get those fresh perspectives. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there's nothing like kind of going into a new business and seeing, you know, what people can't see, so to speak, with, you know, fresh eyes, that type type of thing. So talk to me about the kind of intergenerational leadership then. And this is where I tell everyone that my kids call me a boomer, even though I'm actually not a boomer. My parents are boomers. I'm I'm definitely not a boomer. <laughs> They're like, oh, good one, boomer. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I'm not that old. I'm old, but I'm not that old. Yeah, talk to me. Talk to me about the different kind of generations. Yeah, so Chip Connolly has a really great TED talk on this, and he's someone who had worked in the. Um, uh, say a restaurant but it's not restaurant accommodation business for a long time he had traditional hotels and then he got brought into airbnb and it was really interesting he said he was going to these meetings and there was all of these young people and they knew all about the tech and he had no idea what they were talking about so he had this 25 year old woman who was kind of translating the meetings about what everything meant and he obviously had so much wisdom being from the hotel industry that he could bring into airbnb and he has a great story in his ted talk around this partnership where he calls himself a wisdom worker rather than a um, a knowledge worker and he is able to share that knowledge but really needed that young person to be able to translate and create influence within Airbnb and I think the way that we need to work going forward or the way a lot of organizations are working now is tapping into those best bits of each generation. I know for myself some things that really helped me was when I started Power of Engineering, the not-for-profit, I had some great contacts who were at the CEO level of engineering companies. And they, one gentleman in particular, Peter Bailey, who was the CEO of Arab, he said to me, and this is pretty much a quote, I'm a white old, um, you know, gray haired dude. I'm not gonna be able to go speak to young girls and get them excited about engineering, but you can. And for once I thought, yes, I'm glad I look young. That's usually not a benefit when you're trying to run an engineering project but I could go inspire the students. But what he could do for me was he could actually go into these industries and um, at that senior level and build those relationships and sponsor me. So I really discovered how sponsorship can be powerful and how I needed him and he needed me to deliver on a mission that he had to get more women into engineering as well. So I think that's the way that we'll see, um, you know, change 
accelerating quickly and leadership within organizations when we're partnering those two different or you know multiple generations at the same time yeah i love that that's that's amazing and it is that partnership and that that kind of it's the wisdom to see both sides as well yeah Mm, absolutely yeah and so how do you think, how, how do you think um, COVID has impacted leadership and how do we prepare the next generation of leaders post-COVID? I am just realised the baby monitor is in the corner of the room. I could hear that, but don't worry about it. My editor will just get rid of it. I can Are hear that. Sure? I can just turn yeah. it off and I'll a sec. Oh, if you want. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. I mean, it's not very loud, so don't, yeah, don't right. stress. Yeah. I feel like I'll be distracted. I'll just turn it off. Yeah, turn it off. Yeah. Sorry about that. I feel like my brain goes to another place. Having oh, a <laughs> you can't concentrate when a baby's crying. I can't let, you know, my my husband can happily hear dad, 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 six times. Mine are like mum and I'm like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a rule that I've had for myself, for sure. I'm sorry, you asked such a great question and I've totally forgotten uh, what you asked. Could you repeat That's it? okay. And now I have to remember what I asked as well. Um, what did I ask? I used... I picked up on one of your points here. Oh, that's right. I I said, how did, how do you think COVID has impacted on leadership and how do we prepare the next generation of leaders post COVID? Yeah, I think COVID's been, um, you know, very challenging time. I, I was in Melbourne through lockdown and it was, it was really tough, but what I noticed was people were actually really open about how they were feeling and being okay with not being okay. And it definitely meant a lot more connection was required and going out of your way to reach people and to contact each other and to look out for each other. And I noticed for myself, even though I was on parental leave for a lot of that time, there were so many people who reached out to me and made that connection. So I'm excited to be doing more work from home. I think remote working is here to stay or or a blend of remote working, working from home and working in the office. So I think for emerging leaders, the important piece is how do you get noticed? How do you get visible? And how do you build those relationships across the organization and be in front of the people uh, that you need to be in front of? It's a bit more challenging being at home. You're not just gonna walk past someone's desk, have those incidental conversations. Mm. Um, One of the projects I worked on actually while I was living in Sydney was our um, office refit for Arab. And part of the design was the different spaces and people would bump into each other at different parts of the floor. So it was part of the design to have those incidental conversations. So for emerging leaders to get visible and get ahead, I think they really need to think about how they're going to have those incidental conversations and build relationships when they're not in the office every day. Yeah, I think that's really important. And I think that is, it's that kind of water cooler piece, but I really like your piece about getting noticed and getting vis- being visible. And because I've always talked to team members about, you know, whenever people in leadership roles make decisions about, you know, who's being promoted or who who's going on some program or whatever, you know, they'll talk to their colleagues. And so I always talk about the importance of having multiple relationships with multiple decision makers and stakeholders to kind of, so so that people can say, you know, when you're sitting around the table, how many people are going to say yes to, you know, that whatever that suggestion might be. Definitely. Yeah. I love the saying, um, it's not about who you know, uh, what you know, it's not about who you know, it's about who wakes up thinking about you. Who's going to wake up in the morning and go, I've got this project, that person would be perfect for it. Yeah, I, I had someone that used to work with me and everyone would say, a lot of people would say everyone needs a Carly um, because she was that person that would, mm-hmm. and I uh, hope she's listening and she hears this, um, and she was that person that, you know, I could, give stuff to and she'd get stuff she'd get stuff done and everyone in the building noticed that she got stuff done um absolutely i like that who you think about wake? who do you think about when you wake up and you want to give a piece of work to who comes to mind yeah um so how do we how do we harness the skills of gen gen y and, and gen z to future proof our businesses going forward what oh, age so- are those people gen y and gen z tell me i um, think I'm, i think i must oh. be gen x I think the oldest oldest millennial Gen Y was born in 1981 um, and it spans, um, I think, uh, about 15 years. So, um, gosh, I think it's like the early the ninth, early 90s. Oh, sorry, I'm going to totally scrub the numbers now, late 90s. Um, so I think what 
how do we harness it? What I generation are you in? I'm in millennials, so Gen Y. Okay. Yeah. I'm um, nearly 50. What's that? Mean? <laughs> Gen X, Gen X. Gen X. Gen X. Yeah, I thought yeah. I was Gen X. Yeah, that sounds yeah. so sad when you... <laughs> We've got an au pair who's 18 and I asked her if she knew this classic, like, do you know this band? And I said, looked up their album. Oh, it was released in 2011. You were eight years old. So um, yeah. <laughs> I was talking about. <laughs> oh, yeah. My kids, um, yeah, my young, my oldest is always saying bro. The other day he called me bro. I said, oh, I'm, I'm just not you, bro. I'm just, <laughs> I don't answer to bro. Like, Yeah. <laughs> Uh, what was the question? How do we harness Gen Y and Gen Z workforce to future-proof business? Yeah, business has changed a lot. And, uh, you know, there's so many interesting stats about this, like, you know, such a small percentage of the ASX companies have been around for, you know, 30 plus years. The time's getting shorter and shorter and business is changing. Technology is changing. Um, what we know about the future from organisations like the Foundation for Young Australians, who specifically profiles young people in the workforce, they're talking about the future is global and it's automated and, and there's, you know, a huge technology focus. So I think how we can harness the, um, the future of the emerging leaders right now is being flexible and it's not just around uh, work-life balance, it's all around work-life integration. So for baby boomers, it would have been, um, they started to have that work-life um, blend together and have uh, talk about the balance. Uh, where now for young people, I think it's just life, like purpose fits into our jobs and that's a bigger focus for us rather than how much money you're earning. If you can fulfill on your purpose in your passion, your role, then mm. that's important. So I think um, we're going to see companies you know needing to own up to some of their so social responsibility and even you know in the engineering field um, I've got friends who won't work for certain companies because they've worked on certain mining projects which I think is fascinating so I think we're going to see a lot of employee driven change um, and that certainly happened just in recent times around like uh, the um, uh, marriage equality act where people within organizations said this isn't okay we want you to sponsor this this um, this within our organization actually have a stance as a company so I think there's going to be more of that partnership with employees and business leaders yeah and I think you know when we talk about that flexibility piece you know I think uh, the a lot of organizations have been you know we have a flexibility policy and you've got to you know get approval to be flexible whereas the stance to, should kind of be we're flexible and you've got to have approval to kind of not be flexible does that make sense mm -hmm. do you know what I mean yeah. it's kind of like you've got to you should be opting out rather than yeah rather than sorry I'm absolutely ballsing up what I'm trying to say Nick yeah you know what I'm trying to say it's you know we don't you don't have to get approval to do it's a given that type yeah. of thing rather than yeah and I, I do like your piece around that social responsibility and you know I, I've got to tell you, I've never felt so old in a podcast, actually. <laughs> I'm 34, so it's not, I mean, it's not too, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. And I mean, I, you know, I've talked about these, these things before, and it, but it's really good to talk to you about them and to understand them from where you are as well. So I, I like it. How, what about, what about for women and what do you think about like parenting, et cetera? Mm. Well, it's interesting being say, a new mum, I've got a 10 month old baby, baby Winston. And yeah, it was something that I really thought consciously about and really planned for. And I, thought I would have him earlier and then there was other exciting things in my career and then I thought you know there's always going to be something I um, also do public speaking and I absolutely love it and that was going really really well before COVID happened <laughs> and then you know COVID yeah. happened and I really felt like I was missing out by having a baby and taking time out of the workforce and I think I'd heard a lot of negative stories about it as well and a good friend said to me there's always a right time and I love that she said that because it made yeah. me feel like I, I will make it work and I will make it great. And it has been amazing. I'm very lucky that my employer, um, Swinburne, that I work um, part-time at as well as my other businesses um, actually has 
a paid year of parental leave. Uh, it's 60% for most of that, but that just took a weight off my shoulders. So I think um, there's so much change that's happened in the workforce to support women. And now, you know, talking about going back into the workplace, what does that look like? And, you know, my manager's been incredible about it. And he has children, he does the school run, and it's been so impressive to see that he really leads by example in that sense. And I haven't had a manager like that before. So I think a lot of it is my own judgments about myself, my own expectations that I have. And it's had me actually be more clear about what do I want and putting myself sort of first and saying, these are the things that are important to me. And that goes, I think, for being a mum as well. Like I know, like this morning I went for a swim and it was amazing. And I said to my husband, you need to look after our baby. I need to go for the swim. It'll make me feel great today and put me in the, in the mental space that I need. So I think asking for help is something I find really hard. I hate doing it, but I really had to um, as a new mum. So I think a lot of the expectations I found is that it has been on myself. Yeah, and you, you covered quite a few things there. And like, you know, so, you know, I've, I've been in the game. So I had my first when I was a similar age to you. So I was 35 when I had my first one. And, yeah, the expectations you put on yourself and that ability to ask for help, et cetera. And then I think it is really establishing with your partner and, you know, people around you that sort of support network. And just I think establishing, yes, we want to be great mothers, but you're also a great mother as well if you choose to have a career, if you choose mm -hmm. to, you know, represent that kind of diverseness in your family that men and women can kind of step forward and step back and, yeah, with my husband and I, there's been times, you know, throughout the last 13 years with us that, you know, one person's done more child mind and the other person's done more on their career and kind of vice versa. And it's about kind of establishing what that looks like for yourself and then for workplaces to support that and to, and for men, for men to be able to leave early to pick up kids, that it's not just a woman's problem, that parenting is not just on women and that they're not the ones kind of running out. It's much easier for a man to leave an office. No one ever notices. He just has his keys in his pockets and he just wanders off and everyone wondered where Bill went, you know. Yeah. Um, whereas yeah. with the woman, you know, it's a bit more obvious. You pick up your handbag. We're a bit more kind of, you know, ready to say I'm, I've got to go get my children, whereas a man will just wander off and, no one will see him again. <laughs> it's funny, I've had serious thoughts about if my husband looking after our like our child, and it's so funny how they're just so automatically there, even though I've spent most of my career talking about diversity. And then I think, oh, yeah, he can do those things. And I just didn't even think about it. I just thought I've got to do all of that stuff or I've got to do the child minding. It's just kind of like automatic that I'd be the first person to do it. And then he says to me, you know, I really enjoy spending one on one time with our child. And I think, of course, he does. That's just so silly that I don't even think of those things first. And I've got my, you know, those cultural stereotypes and biases are right there as much as I don't want them to be. Yeah, that's right. I, I agree with you there. So what's next for the Professional Leaders Institute? We're excited to be working with more leaders across Australia and actually we've got overseas people as well. So we're expanding our program and, you know, I'm so passionate about getting more emerging leaders into this space. So uh, we're running boot camps uh, next quarter and um, you can find out more on our website, proleaders.co. And we're excited to transform what leadership looks like in Australia and um, really get amazing people into these leadership roles before you know the traditional time and before people have to kind of wait their time um, yeah before someone at the top decides to drag themselves out of the organization at the age of 65 exactly yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um <laughs> thank you so much felicity for catching up on the lady leadership show um best place for people to get in contact with you then my name felicityfury.com and it's f-u-r-e-y and uh, shoot me an email there or add me on linkedin i love linkedin it's my go-to beautiful and um yeah all the best and yeah just absolutely love that and uh, all the best being a mother and combining that and uh, you're doing incredible work I, I absolutely love it thanks so much sam welcome any parenting tips into my inbox. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely i've got a few of those yeah fantastic thank you awesome <laughs>